Chris Wilson, you are the CEO of WPA Intelligence. Uh, we met while you were the director of analytics on the Ted Cruz for President campaign, and we are talking about the digital transformation of politics. Not really politics, though. We're, we're kind of talking about campaigns and tactics uh, and what business can learn from watching how these hyper-focused campaigns operate in a kind of binary win or lose scenario through this election year. So, uh, Chris, thanks again for your time uh, uh, today. I wonder if we could kind of stop or start with uh, the real high level uh, digital transformation and how political campaigns have evolved over the last uh, even since the days of direct mail, which really was technology in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, to now we have automation, machine learning, predictive analytics, and artificial intelligence. Right. Well, gosh, to go back to, I mean, that's really the beginning of the keeping of lists that today drive the revolution we live in is direct mail. And it's probably the only area of the things I would talk about that Republicans took the lead in back in the early 80s under Ronald Reagan and people like the Jesse Helms machine down in North Carolina, where they started assembling these huge lists for the purposes of just going out. And it was kind of like the version, you know, the 1980s version of spam, where they just send a letter to anybody who'd all ever responded to anything that made those people think that they were conservative. And I said, think, because that was like people learning instead of machine learning. So now that we've moved from the days of uh, those lists that may have had a few different pins on or because they, were, they uh, subscribed to Reader's Digest, that there was an assumption that they might lean conservative or they uh, got the Paul Harvey newsletter to really go old school here, that they might be conservative. They'd add them onto a mailing for Ronald Reagan or National Conservative, Nick Pack, or some of the leaders in this, or like I said, the Jeff C. Helms Conservative Caucus down in uh, – in North Carolina and those kind of the, the ability to uh, begin to assemble those lists. But you take those lists that may have had two or three names on them. And uh, as you and I discussed when we got together in Cleveland, you know, the evolution of the files that allows us to utilize machine learning for the purposes of crunching data and, and moving to the modern day and the implications of 2018, it has grown exponentially to where uh, even as late as 2010, a well-appended voter file would have maybe 200 pieces of first, second, and third party data on it. And then in 14, it grew to about 400, and 16, it grew to about 800. And then in 2016, whenever I uh, played the role that you mentioned for Ted Cruz as director of analytics, we had almost 5,000 pieces of first, second, and third party data on most of our voter file. And I say most of the Republican file, because we didn't make it out of the primary, sadly. Uh, I'm still going through counseling for that, but I'll get over it soon. And moving into 2018, I mean, some important decisions have been made uh, by Google that allows us to match against the voter file, by several other different entities that have allowed us to, uh, to, to grow our files, by the uh, proliferation of quiz apps. It's like everybody wants to, is willing to spend time answering trivia and doing quizzes and all that, or not all that, but a lot of that comes back. And, and the ability of us to utilize all of those data that are now, in some cases, I mean, we have some files that are exceeding tens of thousands, and even in states where we do a lot of work, we build models on top of models, hundreds of thousands of pieces of underlying data and utilizing machine learning for the purposes of finding the trends and uh, you know looking for correlations and no longer caring about causations that allow us to really move into the next level is, um, it's kind of exciting stuff. And as we, I was actually having a conversation with another journalist this morning about this, I mean, the ability to make predictions in 2018 is going to, uh, for a for any campaign, uh, even down to the state rep level. And this used to only be done at the presidential level. And now we do it for state rep campaigns. Uh, next, you know, on March 6th, coming up soon, is the, the Republican primary, or the primaries in Texas. And a lot of, uh, we are working for a lot of state representative candidates where we're utilizing levels of machine learning and predictive analytics that, we, that were not used by the Romney campaign in 2012 just because of Moore's Law and, and massive amounts of data appended. Yeah, and it, it is, when you zoom out a little bit, it is easy to kind of follow campaign to campaign and see uh, the iterative advances make huge steps. I wonder if we could uh, open up a voter file for a second. And I, I mean, you are not exaggerating when you talk about tens of thousands of pieces of uh, data that's kind of appended onto an individual. Can you be specific? Even when I use a tool like L2, 
uh, which lets me see quite a bit of information. What can campaigns learn about a voter? And then how do they convert that information into action? Uh, and I'm, I'm sure the viewer can kind of understand, well, if you run a business and advertiser or marketing, you kind of want the same types of data and to convert your audience into some sort of action. Sure. Well, I'll talk, you know, it's difficult for me to think outside of goals because my clients hire me sure. to reach a specific goal. And in 2016, it was to get Ted Cruz elected, uh, you know, win the Republican primary, uh, which we did okay. We came in second. Uh, but we didn't win. So I guess I failed at that. But then we go into 2018, my clients hire me to either get elected or get reelected. And so my goal in 2018, uh, and I'll talk about this from a corporate angle uh, separately, my goal in 2018 on the Republican side is to find those voters that turned out in 2010 and 2014 and 2016 that voted for Donald Trump. There's, there's a lot of new voters that cast ballots in states like Ohio and Pennsylvania and Iowa and Wisconsin and Florida for Donald Trump that had voted for Barack Obama or not voted at all in past presidential elections. So that is my goal to find those. And to give you an example of how uh, minute our attention is to that, as you know, I do a lot of work in Texas, still work for Ted Cruz, work for Greg Abbott. I can tell you in the state of Texas, there are 2,068,746 voters that do not currently plan to vote in 2018. That if they do vote, will vote for Ted Cruz, Greg Abbott, uh, Will Hurd, John Culberson, Pete Sessions, those are three seats that Hillary Clinton won that Republicans or incumbents have to get reelected in. And, and that's the level of minute detail that we get down to. Now, the file and the underlying data behind that is what allows us to make those predictions. And the difference between making those predictions in 2018, and this is what's important to my clients, I think, and 2016 is the accuracy and the granularity of the prediction. Now, there are far, there's far more that goes into it. How do we motivate them? What do we say to them? Uh, what is it that we know about them? How do we reach them? Uh, one of the things that we just can't, uh, it would be criminal not to talk about on a podcast, uh, broadcast like yours is to talk about you know, the evolution of how people receive information. I mean, right now you're looking at, my most, by 2020, by the next presidential election, 54% of Americans will be what are known as cord cutters. That means they will receive their television from Sling TV, Direct TV Now, PlayStation, Hulu, uh, things like YouTube TV. Then you've got 37% that subscribe to traditional and streaming, and then 9% that have never that will have never been uh, a cord, will have never had cable or satellite at all. So you got cord cutters, you got cord nevers, and you have those that are kind of making the evolution. And you add those up together. And that doesn't leave a lot of people that you could only reach through traditional advertising. I think the traditional advertising uh, model is breaking. And uh, anybody who does not adapt to that, be they political or corporate, is going to find themselves left behind. They're going to spend a lot of money on reaching not a lot of people. Uh, yeah, and some of these technologies like OTT uh, are coupled with targeting tools. Uh, one is built by Zach Moffat uh, and, and others who have – a pedigree in political technology and have kind of bridged the gap into the private sector. Uh, Chris, I wonder if you could leave us with uh, uh, some insights into the technology, the actual tech tools that are being used on this year's midterm election and what sorts of technologies we can expect uh, uh, as, as voters make decisions and, and as they pull the lever in November. Well, as we, I will tell you what we're working on because uh, unfortunately, all my friends at Blue Lab and Simpsons Analytics, which are the versions of us on the left, don't invite me into their office to look at their new tools. But uh, I know they're probably doing the same, if not more, over there because they uh, they tend to have a little bit larger budgets than we do, believe it or not. So, I, I, the, some of the things that we're working on is. Um, is our goal is to be able to be sort of a, a Netflix or an Amazon type of environment for Republican campaigns. And what I mean by that is in the same way that Amazon can predict whenever you're about to run out of, uh, run out of shampoo or Netflix predicts what you want to watch next on television, they get pretty good at it. That's what we're trying to do is building in artificial intelligence into our database, which is uh, we call we named Archimedes. Give me a lever and I can move the world. And we put, we are building and we have a uh, building APIs with all the right of center tech programs. You mentioned Zach Moffat at Target Victory, uh, Michael Beach, his former partner at Cross Screen that has another type of utility. There's uh, deep root targeting and all of those that we can build and ingest data into and build, send data back out and be able to make predictions about voters on a real time basis. Because in the same way that product needs or television watching, need, watching desires change quickly, so do uh, what positions, what issues are going to motivate you to turn out and vote 
and vote for a specific candidate. So that is our goal to be able to build those same sort of predictive analytics, those same sort of predictive technologies, same sort of artificial learning technologies into what we have so that we're able to work back of campaigns, ingest all of their data very quickly, be able to turn around and give back to them a level of prediction down to the single voter level that will allow them to make decisions about who they're talking to and what they're saying to that voter. And we feel like if we can do that, then we will have gone a long way toward bridging the gap between where, uh, where we are today and where we need to be going into 2020.